our next speaker, David, is also one of the people that uh, presented a couple of times here at Brucon. Um, so this time he's going to uh, entertain us with some old single sign-ons and uh, the pain and the uh, fun that goes with it. So please give him a round of applause. I thought I was going to be juggling for you guys. I'm, I'm, supposed, to, I'm supposed to speak? Okay. Everyone, thanks for having me again. Uh, this is my, actually, my, my third uh, BrewCon, and uh, so I'm excited to be back. Uh, so just a, you know, a little bit about myself. So uh, I'm David Mortman. I'm uh, the chief security architect at Dell Software, and uh, I somehow convinced someone to also give me the title of uh, distinguished engineer, which is impressive since I don't write code. Uh, but you know, I also don't drive a train, so or build bridges, so you know, that's it. So the thing is, I'm gonna to talk today about, uh, about identity, single sign-on, federation, you know, the whole authorization, authentication space, and you know, frankly, this is a sad story. There's no happy ending to this talk, I'm gonna warn you now. Um, th th there's no good news here, um, well, maybe a little bit of good news, we'll see what happens as we, as we go through this, but uh, this, is, this really is a sad story. Things are kind of a cluster, um, and uh, you know, ID, identity, this is a, a, a huge problem out there, really. I mean, it's hard. This is a hard problem to solve, and not only that, we're bad at it. I mean, we're really, really bad at it, in fact. Um, you look at things like the Verizon reports. Every year that Verizon's done the DBAR, what, six, seven years in a row now? Every single year, one of the biggest vectors is identity. You know, default passwords. Re password reuse, uh, pretty much most of the major breaches that have happened for uh, like restaurants and SMBs who are using you know, point of sale terminals that are basically PCs or Macs, um, every single one of them, those breaches is because a vendor who supplies these to the customers used the same password everywhere. So it's, it's, like, it's like taking candy from a toddler, really. Um, and. Uh, Actually, it's easier than taking candy from a toddler. I have a five-year-old who is a little bit older than a toddler. I don't get any of Halloween candy. Like, you know, they're really protected. They hold on tighter to their candy than, uh, than we hold on to passwords, honestly. Um, so, they, you know, maybe we should have kids manage our passwords for us. Uh, yeah. Well, the password's star, 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 star. Um, but it's a huge problem, like I said. You know, we're really bad at managing passwords. Um, when you start looking at... Like I said, these uh, breaches at uh, point of sale terminals, they use the same password everywhere. So, and it's, by the way, it's a, of course, admin level password. And then when the miscreants figure out what that is, they just scan the entire internet. And they find all the thousands of machines they can get into with the same root password. I mean, you know, uh, Chris alluded to this earlier in his, in his opening talk. You know, it's just, don't use the same password everywhere. And don't store it in clear text. Yeah, not. But you know, the thing is, I mean, I hit myself my slides. It's also really Boring. Okay, so who here has to manage identity on a regular basis? Then? Yeah, a reasonable number. Yeah, is that? Do you look forward to that? Do you say, you know what? I really want to do an identity management matrix today. That's that's what excites me. No, it's boring. It's really, really boring. And did I mention that we're bad at it? I mean, we're re we really are bad at it. It's um. It's, the thing is, this is not rocket science. Take the user, create them a password, create them a credential. When they change roles, adjust their authorization. When they leave the company, disable that password. But it turns out, this is not, compli it's, this is not complex. It's not even that complicated. But it is really, really hard. Um, and that's the thing is that, you know, it's not rocket science. Uh, anyone who was here at uh, my keynote two years ago, I, I ranted a lot about how a lot of what we do in security is not rocket science, uh, it's, but it's boring. And you know, I, for one, would much rather you know, go home when I get home next week, start playing with all the new things that Amazon announced that are security related for its service. That's some cool stuff. There's config management, there's policy stuff. There's some really high level stuff that could make Amazon all the more secure. But the reality is, is I'm gonna spend a bunch of time talking with folks on the product teams about how to make identity easier to manage. And we'll all be bored. But because it's not exciting, it's not, it's not sexy, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't generate good headlines, uh, it certainly doesn't you know, get good press, even at things like the RSA conference, which is all about getting press releases out. Um, 
And it's, like, it's even boring, even before you get to the authorization space, which is this whole different world easy. So like I said, it's basic, but it's not easy. Did I mention boring? Anyone else? <laughs> really, I mean, and w once you get to the authorization space, it gets even more boring. Ooh, look, it's a big, you know, end by end by end by end chart trying to figure out who gets the ability to do what. And I'll get more into the authorization stuff uh, later. But I mean, when you think about some of the biggest breaches we've had, like the Society General breach several years ago, you know, a trader bounced back and forth between the front end of the front office and the back office, and he kept his access to the both front end systems and the back end systems so he could defraud the bank. He had the ability to cover his own tracks to the tune of something like two or three billion dollars in, in trade fraud because we, they didn't have basic, you know, move, add, change as his, as his role changed within a company. I mean, this, this should never have happened except for the part where it's not the easiest task to do. And it actually gets exponentially harder every time you add an identity management endpoint. Uh, and it's not made any easier by the fact that, you know what we're stuck, where we're still at? Passwords. Really, this is where we are. It's, it's 2015. <clears throat> We've had passwords on our systems for 30, 40, 50 years. And, you know, the state of the art for most people is a password. Eight characters generally. Maybe if you're lucky, you can uh, get down to six. Uh, Amazon actually lets you do as few as, I think as few as six and, you know, you, there's no complexity requirements. They don't care. They want your money. It's worth it for them. Uh, but typically in an enterprise environment, you know, you're eight to ten characters, numbers, characters, symbols, uppercase, lowercase, DNA sampling, retina prints, you know, the name of your first girlfriend, boyfriend, dog, whatever. You know. And if you can, and then you have to change it every every 30 to 60 days. If you know, actually, where I work, every 60 days, it's a good thing I have a password manager that lets me generate random BS passwords, and I never have to type them anywhere because otherwise I'd be doing the same thing everyone else does, which is you know a post-it note and changing the last digit or something on the password, right? Okay, honestly, who uses a password manager? Nice. I think that's the best response I've ever got to that at any security conference, even. Thank you. You guys rock. Um, Way to deal with that password problem. Um, how are we doing? Okay, so, you know, so then there's hey, MFA, yay, yeah, two factor passwords, multi factor. Good stuff, right? Yeah, mostly, except for, for a lot of people, it's still really hard. I mean, so, Secure ID, who has, did anyone have to use an actual physical Secure ID token or a similar one, like where it changes every 60 Yeah, we've got a few hands up still. Uh, <clears throat> isn't that fun? Do you carry more than one? Yeah, I had, I had one job where I had like four on a keychain. Wait, which one is it? You know, this is not useful. Okay, yeah, there we go. Thank you. So, I mean, in principle, it's a great idea, but it's not really user friendly. The last thing you, if someone wants to do is constantly have this thing out. And this is one place where actually we've made some great progress. Uh, I love this. I have, no, I have no affiliation with Google other than as a user. Google Authenticator is awesome. Anyone else use Google Authenticator? Yeah. It's, it's great, isn't it? It like, really solves a lot of the problems, <clears throat> as long as you don't accidentally wipe your phone without a backup, in which case uh, life becomes supremely painful to recover from. So I hope you all have saved somewhere that's not on your phone the printed out code so you can get back in to re-authenticate your phone for your authenticator. That's pretty cool. The other thing that I love in this space is the ability that Google has added to where you only have to do multi-factor authentication like once a month. I think that's a great compromise in terms of usability. You know, the average user, okay, so once a month you have to pull the phone out and use that to get to Authenticator or copy out of an SMS. That seems like a nice compromise, right? It's not quite as tight or efficient as every time you log in that you have to use it, but it seems like a nice compromise. This is actually a really nice, I like this actually. I'm a big fan of, of this solution. Um, I've just started looking at Fido. This looks pretty cool, I have to say. They just uh, GitHub just announced some integration with Fido and uh, YubiKeys, so you just tap your YubiKey and you authenticate to GitHub, um, all certificate-based and things like that. I haven't dug deep into that, but this looks promising from an individual user perspective for doing some nice, uh, pretty secure, multi-factor authentication. If we tie it into something like OAuth or SAML, really OAuth, this gives us some potential, long-run potential as individual consumers uh, to solve some good, so to solve some problems. Um, but as I was saying, the general problem is that uh, every time, you know, especially for an organization, every time you add an identity management endpoint, someplace new where you have to manage users, the job of whoever's job it is to manage identity gets exponentially harder just looking at authentication. This means, you know, one more place that you need to disable a user. <clears throat> Excuse me.
excuse me. That's just one, like I said, one place to disable a user, another place to add a user, make changes, and whenever things happen. So we came along with, you know, we said we need, we need, we need single sign-on. This way we centralize that username and password into a single place, uh, single point of failure, single point of compromise, but ease of use for the users. So, you know, well, this started with single sign-on 15 years ago at least. And we're still terrible at single sign-on. I mean, it's not that complicated. So I've, I've deployed a few of these systems over the years. Um, but even today, uh, one of the clients I work with, um, you authenticate to the first app. Uh, no, by the way, you go to the website. It's a non, it's a third-party site that they've single sign enabled using a, I think ping, but it's actually irrelevant to whoever, whatever the vendor is. And what I get is an HTTP basic pop-up. 2015, I'm getting, I'm, I'm encouraging my users to uh, type in an HTTP basic pop-up window. That's not, that's, not, that's not exactly, you know, training people with the right incentive scheme. You know, like, yeah, sure, just type your password into a random box that popped up. You have no way to authenticate that it even came from the right space. Um, and then when I go to the next app, I have to do it again. Um, and if I VPN into the client, every time I hit a new web page, sometimes I have to do that again and again because it really has no concept of a non-Windows user, um, even though I'm authenticating. And I have an agent that's supposed to do that as well. So this, this still sucks. The single sign-on is a pain. And, you know, we started out, you know, these, first we had these proprietary systems, you know, uh, SiteMinder. Anyway, everyone remember SiteMinder? It's now a CA product. Um, and then we had, you know, IBM or someone, had, they have like WebSeal. Uh, there was Securant, which RSA owns now. There's, there was a host of others, but basically they're all pr these proprietary protocols. And we said, yes, they sort of work as long as we are inside our enterprise using no third-party apps and you're on Windows and authenticated to the domain. It mostly kind of works as long as you're running IE6 Service Pack 2 with the following hotfixes and it's a Tuesday and the moon is at, you know, is waning or waxing depending on which uh, configuration option you clicked on. Um, and we said, you know what? Oh, also, everyone remember Microsoft Passport? Anyone? I'm um, the old fart, apparently. Um, it was Microsoft's attempt to do internet-based single sign-on, and everyone said, no, we don't trust you. We're not going to let you do that. And then a whole bunch of companies, including Sun and SGI, probably Dell and HP, I don't know who else, all said, we're going to come up with the, uh, the Liberty Federation, Liberty Project for doing uh, open source federation, and no one deployed that. Even, you know, so that wasn't so hot. So we said, you know what, we need, we need open source. We need, a, not open source necessarily, we need an open standard for, feder for a single sign-on. By that point, we're calling it Federation, and we came up with WS Fed. It's all XML-y. Did I hear someone say boo? Thank you. And it turned out that uh, WS Fed was heavily backed by Microsoft. And as a result of politics and whatnot, pretty much the only people who actually use WS Fed are, was Microsoft and heavy Microsoft partners. So WS Fed works, it works today. If you're a complete 100% Microsoft shop, it works pretty well for, for both single sign-on federation, you authenticate against your active directory, either with your you know, username and password or multi-factor authentication, it kind of does the job. But no one has a pure Microsoft shop today and it doesn't really work with anything that's cloud-based because no one, almost no one is actually running things on Microsoft in the cloud. Doesn't, so it doesn't work with, you know, your Salesforces or um, Workday or whoever you know, you're using for your, uh, or Concur or any of your other sort of third-party um, cloud-based apps you'll be using. And soon after that, we got SAML. SAML's pretty cool. It's, it's pretty secure, you know, lots of certificate-based authentication between components. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, SAML is its own little nightmare, however. Anyone here deployed SAML? Did you cry? I, uh, or at least want to, because I certainly, you know. I mean, the thing about SAML is, I like to talk about, when I talk about SAML, the op, you know, there's actually more optional portions of the standard than there are required portions of the standard. I mean, I, when, I, when, I, when I look at SAML, I think of the old uh, Tannenbaum quote about the one of the great thing about standards is there's so many to choose from. Um, that's pretty much the same, the same case with, uh, with options when you get into SAML. It's a complete nightmare. I have never seen uh, an integration between two different SAML providers work without custom engineering. Not once. It's hard enough to make it work when it's all the same product. 
Um, but as soon as you're trying to make, especially if it's one of the open source versions, talk to a commercial version or even two commercial versions to talk to each other. They are, they're all standards compliant, <clears throat> but they've chosen different options to support, different criteria to support. Um, and most of them, actually, I've yet to see a single SAML provider that properly supports all the requirements, even if it's that complex. Um, most notably, what's usually missing is single logout. Because uh, that's one thing that's missing from most single sign-on products, is the ability to log out of it. When you normally, when you're single sign-on enable, you know, you go, you click log out in your application, and all it really means is that you've quit out of that window. But if you go back to the product, you're re-authenticated automatically and you're back in. Um, SAML actually requires that you have a single logout option, so you can either go to the IDP or even from within a single app when you click logout, it should log you out of everything. Um, as a result, um, you know, in a lot of ways, no one's SAML compliant. And I was, I was working with a product team, and I said, look, so we need single logout. And they said, what's that? And I'm like, here are the identity folks. You don't know what single logout is? And they said, hold on a second. I hear a lot of clicking in the background and some muttering, but oh, right. That is part of the standard required profiles, isn't it? I read that eight years ago when I first learned about SAML. Um, so it's just hard to make work together. It's a nightmare. I've had nightmares trying to deploy multiple SAML providers. Uh, it's not fun. Um, I sort of jumped ahead of myself, so we'll, we'll get past the HTTP basic, but this happens a lot. Um, not just more with SAML than anything else. Um, in fact, SAML is such a pain. So SAML has this concept of an identity provider. It's basically a proxy that sits between the app you're trying to authenticate to and your backend directory. It you know, generally sits on the, on the internet edge, the, your gateway or something like that, and it proxies the requests back and forth so that way you get to the right directory and things like that. Uh, this is enough of a pain point for most companies that there's actually an entire market of people who are doing just hosted identity providers. So it's just, it's just a proxy. It sits there on the internet and communicates back to your directory or whatever you're using for your backend authentication to your MFA provider, or whatever it happens to be. Um, you know, simplified, they just got acquired by RSA. Uh, there's Okta. Um, they're doing quite well. Um, Microsoft has ADFS, which is basically an ID, a, a IDP provider that you can either get through Azure or you can host your own. Um, but this is how problematic the space is that we generated a, you know, probably a 20 to $50 million market at least to handle this one little piece of it because it's, a, it's such a pain point <clears throat> that for enterprises, that's what we got going on. So that's kind of a, kind of a problem. And then we have OAuth. Anyone else, you know, OAuth, you see, you know, the most likely place you've seen it is if you uh, authenticate to anything from your phone. So, you know, Twitter, Facebook, actually, I guess Facebook doesn't really do OAuth. Um, but third-party clients, like, uh, I use TweetBot for Twitter. Um, when you authenticate to, it, when you authenticate to Twitter, you're not, ac you're actually, it, uh, this app, you don't type your credentials into the app, it actually redirects you to Twitter's login page and you authenticate there and say, I'm authorizing this device. And this is an important um, thing, is that OAuth is, used as an authentication protocol, but technically it's an authorization protocol. You're basically telling an app or either like a, a web app or a mobile app that you have the ability, that you're now authorizing that device or that application to act on behalf of the user. So you're not really authenticating using OAuth, you're, authoriz you're authorizing something. Um, and that works reasonably well on an individual consumer basis. But still, this means that this is, does not do any good for organizations that have you know, this is, it's really open ID, it's next generation open ID, so really great. As an individual user, I can go, oh, hey, look, I can now authenticate, I can use TweetBot instead of the default Twitter client, because the default Twitter client is awful. Um, to, to add to the excitement, there's multiple versions of OAuth. There's OAuth v1, which has all sorts of delicious security features in it, including encrypt encryption and message signing and all this good stuff. And it, was used by a few organizations, and then V2 came out. V2 made all the security features optional. And frankly, it took off like gangbusters. A lot more organizations started using it because it was a lot simpler to implement, it was less complicated. Um, I, I think of this as the Betamax problem. I, I talked about this a few years ago when I was, uh, when I was talking about the difference between REST and uh, SOAP APIs. By all sort of reasonable definitions, V1 is the better protocol to use because it has all the security features there. You have to implement them and do it the right way. 
trademark, copyright, et cetera, et cetera. It's kind of like Betamax. It was by any sort of standard definition the better product. Um, but V2 is like VHS. It's easier to use. It's like REST. It's easier to use. It's very friendly. It's inexpensive in comparison. Um, it's lower quality, but it's, it meets enough of a need. It sort of meets the minimum viable product requirements for most people. So it got picked up. It was a lot easier to, to implement and deploy. So we have V2 instead. Uh, there is a V3. Uh, V3 has turned into a political nightmare. Um, I think it's pretty much DOA at this point. Enough people who are in the core product are so pissed off at the direction of V3 that they've quit the project and it's just kind of sitting there and there's discussions of going straight to V4, but I'm not sure where things uh, stand with that. I haven't really been following the political machinations there, but uh, V2 is pragmatically where we're at. Uh, it has, like I said, there's no requirement for OAuth to use HTTPS. There's no message signing. There's not, there's not a lot of security there. Um, so it's all up to the provider. Uh, another downside, and I was talking to some folks earlier, I added this slide today because you know, I was, I was talking to a bunch of folks, and they said, you know what, OAuth is cool, but there's a whole lot of apps and sites I, I, I won't use because I'm not on Facebook. And if I want to use that application, I have to have a Facebook account, and I don't, I don't use Facebook. Um, or I don't want to give them access to my Google credentials. Uh, I got pointed at an app. Someone emailed me and said, hey, you should get this cool new app on LinkedIn. I'm like, so I took a poke at it and said, you need to authenticate, uh, do an OAuth authentication against your LinkedIn account. I'm like, Okay, well, <clears throat> the great thing about OAuth is it generally tells you um, what privileges, sort of like when you, when you add a new app on Android, it says here's the things it has access to. Well, OAuth gives you the ability to say that as well. So it says, okay, well, it can see your full profile. That's fine, everyone can see my full, pro my, my full profile whether they're authenticated to LinkedIn or not. I don't care about that. And it's like, well, it can see all your first and secondary connections. I'm like, hmm, I'm, I'm not sure how I feel about that. Like, that's something you usually have to be logged in to sort of see my, some of my connections. And then it says, oh, and we want to be able to send email on your behalf as you and read your email and respond to your email for you on your behalf. And I was like, fuck you. <clears throat> and hit the cancel button. But it's just like, no, I mean, you know, it's sort of one thing to say you can authenticate against someone else's directory and quite another to be like, and let me impersonate you whenever I want. So, uh, this actually stops a lot of people from using some of these apps because they don't want necessarily to authenticate with those credentials or you know, share, some of the, share that access back. Are we having fun yet? Because right now, I mean, this makes me, every time I think about this, it just makes me more nauseous than anything else. Um, and what this does in this situation is also tends to, you know, you, get, you end up in another one of these phishing scenarios where once, if you get phished, in pretty much any of these single sign-on environments with the passwords, you're really screwed because you just gave up access to everything. And you know, frankly, you know, in most corporate environments, it's not that big a deal <clears throat> because most of us don't have access to anything truly interesting in a corporate environment. Um, I actually have no access to anything interesting in my current job, which is kind of cool. Um, certainly some people do. Um, so of course, I'm going to say, yeah, use multi-factor authentication because, you know, at least that gives you some level of protection. Um, so we're, we're back to the sort of general sp problem space of how are you gonna do that? What is, what is your multi-factor gonna be? Is it gonna be FIDO? Is it gonna be Secure ID? Is it gonna be Google Authenticator? Um, and some of these work better um, than others for enterprises. Um, <clears throat> and so one of the things to sort of think, you know, so I think one of the big differences between, you wanna really think about, you know, wh when would I encounter SAML? and that nightmare versus when I encounter OAuth, and it's a whole different nightmare, is that, uh, you know, SAML is pretty much an enterprise. It's an organizational level product. You're not gonna see it as, an, as a typical user um, just running around doing things. You might, so like my bank is using SAML for some godforsaken reason. I have no idea why, because they only have one directory. Um, but I suspect it's because they've outsourced a portion of uh, the online banking stuff, so it's actually multiple customers hiding um, but maybe not. Um, and OAuth is really more of a consumer product. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so that's where you're likely to encounter them. So depending on your use case and whether you're writing an application, you know, like a consumer app or whether you're supporting an enterprise or somewhere in between, uh, you'll, see, you'll, you'll either see these in different places um, or uh, you'll have different nightmares depending on what your job is and how you have to manage these. Um, so that's for sure. And then to add, to the excitement, you have the whole authorization space. 
So authentication is bad enough. It's enough to make people ill. It's enough to make me tear my hair out. It causes nightmares. And it just sucks. I mean, this is a huge problem space. Um, then you get to authorization. And it's way, 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 way worse than authentication. I mean, authentic, you know, by, by comparison, authentication is child's play. You know, you get to create the user, give them credentials, they log in. Life is good. Well, authorization is a lot worse. And, you know, it's worse for a lot of reasons. Um, one is those ugly matrices, which I talked about at the beginning. Suddenly you need to figure out who can do what, when, where, and how. Um, and, you know, it's not so bad when you have 50 users. You probably have three or four different things users might do. They might have developer, a sysadmin, salesperson, finance. You have a couple different roles. It's not so complicated. Uh, when, I, when I worked at, I used to be the CISO at Siebel. We had five applications. That's it. We had our own SQL instance. There was like email. There was uh, I almost said Salesforce. Um, there was PeopleSoft, and there was the procurement system, and like that's it. Not complicated. You know, five five total applications, and our roles and responsibilities matrices were a nightmare. It was Excel spreadsheet after Excel spreadsheet after Excel spreadsheet, mostly because PeopleSoft and Siebel are so complex that the, the roles and responsibilities and things within them were complicated enough. But so with just five applications, trying to map who could do what, depending on their job role, uh, needed, we would update it yearly, and it usually took a couple months to do right. The typical enterprise, and I shit you not, has between five and 10,000 applications when you're looking at like the Fortune 500, the Forbes 2000. So just, I mean, try to imagine, just to figure out who can do what in those applications. And then to make matters worse, each of those applications has its own authorization system that's built in natively to the application. This is why I say this is hard. Because, I mean, you can have a full team of people whose only job 100, you know, 365 days a year is to figure out, is to track these things, and they'll still be falling behind. Uh, so people start saying, you know what we need is, <clears throat> excuse me, is we need a way of centralizing authorization. Let's get that authorization out of the applications. Let's get a centralized directory for authorization, much like we do with authentication. And the first steps were pretty good. They said, let's define group. You know, you can grab groups of users on the basis of things like Active Directory LDAP. So then at least as users are created, you put them in the right groups, and that gets mapped to the appropriate roles within your uh, application. That's a nice step, and that sort of solves some, makes it at least a little bit easier so when you, you can move a user out of that group and they lose those roles. Um, but that doesn't really, that's, a, that's, a, that's a incremental, an important incremental change, but it doesn't solve the general problem that you still have creating the policies and the rules in those individual applications. So along came Zacamole. Because we weren't, ha <laughs> thank you, Zacamole. This makes WS Fed look cute and charming. Um, it's XML based because XML is the future, right? Thank you. Uh, no, it's awful. Um, I mean, it's so awful that we came up with JSON. Um, um, yes, it's that bad. Um, but it's still, it, it, JSON's actually a lot better, but that's a different story. Um, but Zacamol makes SAML look simple getting it to work right. Um, it's a complete nightmare. Um, it has some good parts, though. Um, it, it, it really introduced uh, most of the entity world to the concept of attribute-based access control. Uh, so, and attributes are really cool. Let's use some really fun stuff. So like uh, one app that I really work with um, is it's a cloud thing, and it says, only the person who owns a resource in the cloud provider can terminate that resource. Yeah. So it means that you know, as a regular user you know, in that group, I could reboot anyone else's EC2 instance. I can pause it, I can stop it, but I can't terminate it unless I'm the one who launched it. Um, I think I, showed, I probably shared this story at a previous talk, but uh, I was working at an earlier company, and we were running everything on Amazon, and we didn't have an attributes-based access control system in place. And it's Friday afternoon, five o'clock my time, <clears throat> and I'm prepping for an upgrade in production. 
and I get an IM from one of our developers saying, I'm really, really sorry. What do you mean you're sorry? And he just responded back, I'm really, really sorry. Said, Matthew, what did you do? He says, well, you know, as, as a lead developer, I have full admin credentials to the development AWS account. I'm like, yeah, I know, I gave those to you. And he said, well, I was, spending, I was doing some testing and I spun up some resources and I terminated them and I spun up some other ones and I terminated them. And then I did it again and I clicked on the machines and I clicked terminate and my boxes didn't go away. So I clicked on terminate a few more times and the boxes were still there. And then suddenly Dan popped his head over my cube and said, I can't get to the main Oracle development database. And then someone else said, I can't get to it either. And it turned out that Matthew had accidentally terminated all of the development databases. Oops. Because we didn't have the ability at that time to do something like he could only terminate the boxes that he started. And so we canceled the production upgrade and I spent the next several hours restoring the databases. Fortunately, there were good backups, but still, it was Oracle, which meant that even with a good backup, it was you know, four or five hours to re-roll logs and all that stuff. Um, and other folks I've talked to have basically implemented similar rules to prevent those sorts of accidents from happening. Uh, it's amazing how often those accidents happen when you have quota, financial quotas in place for a group. Suddenly you think, oh, David doesn't need those resources. I do, I'll just blow away what he started so that way I free up some you know, cash for my project. It happens accidentally a lot, it turns out. Um, People have fat finger things near the end of budget cycles a lot. Um, this helps prevent that sort of thing, um, or similarly, just the ability to say, um, the attributes include things like source IP. Okay, I'm going to force anyone coming from this IP range to use multi-factor authentication because they never log in from there before. Or, you know what, they're coming in from, I'll pick on China because everyone picks on China. You know, we, you know they may be in China, but let's just double check. The, uh, so if they're coming in from, the China IP address ranges, then they should authenticate again, but use multi-factor authentication. Um, so attributes are really cool, and they go really, really well with role-based access control. So um, they make a nice combination of ability to say traditional RBAC, throw on some attributes on top of each other. Um, but it turns out this is still a really hard problem. Uh, the typical organization who says they're using Zacamal lies. They're not, they're using the concepts of Zacamole and they're generally doing a pretty standard key, you know, key value store or a little mini JSON kind of thing. Almost no one uses X, actually uses XML and no one's actually using the protocol. The standards are vile, uh, they're unreadable, uh, the samples are useless. Um, one of these days I might actually have to, I would I'd be tempted to actually write something uh, that was better but no one uses, actually uses Zacamole so it sort of seems uh, pointless. That could do more important things like, you know, drink more good Belgian beer. Um, so, Zacamole's kind of a mess. <laughs> so, yeah, so, just trade point out that all, all of the Zacamole committee chairs work for Oracle. Uh, we'll let people draw their own conclusions on the basis of that. Um, I was almost an Oracle employee for 24 hours. which is a whole different story. Uh, Marianne loves me, by the way. Um, but different story. I actually got her to fire me from Oracle before I got started. Ask me later about that one. Um, so, like, so Zacamole, is, there's a couple, there's probably a hundred enterprises, maybe 200 who are using some Zacamole-like thing. Um, they're the ones who are sort of on the cutting edge of this stuff, and they're all doing basic key value stores, usually using JSON instead of XML because it's so much better. Um, but again, they're basically doing the basic attribute thing. Um, and they're using some sort of usually Active Directory or LDAP to store these things. And it's all for custom in-house built applications. Um, so it's not gonna help you if you have any sort of commercial off-the-shelf application. If you're using an Oracle or a Siebel or PeopleSoft, which are now all Oracle, um, or any other sort of commercial stuff like that. Uh, oh, I've yet to find a SaaS provider that supports Zacamal. I've yet to find a, any sort of PaaS or EAS vendor that supports Zacamole, so you're, you know, you can improve things if you have a lot of in-house applications, but it really is, again, it's an incremental improvement. 
And like I said, you know, I'm going a little fast here, but it's still a sad story. There is no happy ending. There's no happy ending in sight. Um, I really don't have any advice for you even on how to make things better uh, other than try your best to get some sort of SAML-y thing working for your, uh, for your organization um, and be willing to reallocate resources to those really basic things. This whole identity project uh, is really, really boring and no one wants to do it. I don't want to do it. I do it anyway. Uh, there was an internet meme about that, but we we'll, won't get into that. Um, and, you know, the compliance folks don't drive it hard enough for anyone to really care. They say, oh good, you have your password changing requirements and you have some sort of central directory. And so, until the incentive scheme changes to get us to change anything, nothing's gonna change. Uh, the compliance regimes don't require us to do it. The executives at most companies don't make us change it. The CIO, the CISOs don't have enough leverage uh, to make anyone change it. And no one really wants to, so we're, we're kind of screwed. And that's my sad, sad story for today. So thank you for coming out and listening to me rant. If you have any questions, I have, uh, I have a bit of time left, so uh, let me know. authorizations in place so like let's say you know politics solved themselves and we did get OAuth 3 or 4 right. would, is any of this like either attribute um, based access controls or authorizations showing up there so there is some authorizations of even even in v2 there's the ability to sort of assign classes of users so I mean typically for most organizations you get sort of a there's sort of the read only and read write and sort of admin level sort of concept uh, which is the, the most granular most organizations get, like especially with uh, uh, most uh, web-based apps, it's usually the choice is read-only or read-write, so it's the ability to sort of, can I pull or can I actually push things back as well. Um, in principle, I mean, so with both SAML and OAuth, in principle, you can define attributes both in the sort of broad sense of this is what a user can do in a traditional, in a traditional RBAC sense, um, as well as an ABAC sense. They both have the concepts built in, uh, they just are not well leveraged. Uh, you know, your typical organization who's using SAML is defining the authorization internally in its own things. Um, and to the extent they're even using SAML for authorizations, they're just defining, they're just asserting what group um, the user should be in as opposed to pre-populating that user with an Active Directory or LDAP sync or something like that. But all the authorization levels are still defined within the application as opposed to defining it within the SAML query. Though you could, in principle, do it. Uh, basically, no one does. They're still too busy trying to make, you know, the SAML provider talk to the IDP to talk to the database. Hey, Dave. I, yes, I, Trey. Hello. Um, hey there. You kind of glossed over the FIDO Alliance stuff. Um, could you speak a little bit more to that? Because that seems promising. So yeah, FIDO seems, is really interesting. Um, Michael Barrett, <clears throat> who used to be the CISO at PayPal, was one of the people involved early on, as well as Paul Simmons, who was, for people who've been around for a while, uh, was a founder of the Jericho Project which these days I guess we more call deperimeterization. Um, it's really an idea to come up with a standardized multi-factor authentication approach uh, that as much as possible is centralized, is user focused, so it's certificate based. Um, it lets you do multi-factor. Um, I haven't dug deep into FIDO yet. It does look promising as a, at least as a uh, consumer based uh, uh, product. Uh, I have a pile of facts and things on my laptop I, had, I didn't get a chance to dig into yet. But uh, that is, in terms of, on the, on the user-focused multi-factor authentication side of things, it looks really promising to have a, a fairly standardized process that will work across apps. But that would potentially displace OAuth, but not address the enterprise use case. Well, it would, it would, it would, it's more of a replacement for, uh, pa for pa usernames and pa for, for passwords as opposed to the authentication. It's not really, it's an authentication fix, it's not an authorization fix. You would still need something, generally, what you really see these days with OAuth is it's just, it's acting as a redirect uh, from the app to the appropriate point at the backend directory provider. So like with Twitter, when you go to app, authorize an app, 
it redirects you to the actual Twitter login page. And then you do that there. OAuth sort of handles that, whatever, BO2, whatever the HTTP redirect would normally be. Um, and then you would use username and password or multi-factor, you know, it's traditional multi-factor if you set it up with your phone for uh, like a SMS-based auth or FIDO if they start, if Twitter starts supporting it. Um, similar same thing with Git, so like with GitHub, the idea is you no longer have a pat, you don't use your password, you just touch the YubiKey and then it sends off the appropriate cert magic to make it happen. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, so just to summarize to make sure I, I heard you correctly, uh, the idea of, one of the things about, the idea behind FIDO is to let you do an assessment of the, the strength of, the, of your belief that a user is their user on the basis of their device, where they're coming from, some attribute based stuff as well as sort of say how they authenticated, like it's something you know, so it's a search or a, or a token or something like that, it's much more likely to be me or fingerprint as opposed to a you know, four character password or six character password or something like that. Sound good? Thank you. Anything else? Okay, so just to, wait, so to make sure, what's my view on OpenID? I haven't looked, I mean, <clears throat> I haven't looked a whole lot at OpenID. In a lot of ways, OAuth sort of replaced OpenID. There's OpenID Connect, which is basically OAuth V2 with some some magic on top of it. Uh, my main, I mean, I think it's fine. Um, it, works, it works reasonally well in a consumer environment uh, if you're savvy enough to, you know, manage your own authentication systems. Um, I think most people aren't, um, and they're just sort of asking for trouble. Um, but I mean, that's sort of, you know, we get back in the states. There was the whole uh, recent issue where uh, it became, it came out that several. Uh, officials at various levels over the years have been managing their own email servers, uh, most notably uh, Hillary Clinton recently, but it turns out most of the secretaries of state for the last like 15 years have managed, had all their email and personal email servers they were managing themselves. Um, and it's hard enough to manage email when you're deeply technically competent and you spend a lot of time on it. Um, and I think that's, and when, you know, keeping his directory secure is sort of like, it's one of those three, one of those magic things on the, you don't want to break. You don't want to break DNS, you don't want to break BGP and you don't want to break your directory server um, because those are sort of like the three core, three core legs that, you know, a secure internet experience relies on is, you know, am, am, I, say, am, I, who I, am I who I say I am? Am I going to the right site and is the routing actually legitimately bringing me there? Um, so I think for most cases, OpenID is a nightmare waiting to happen for the typical user. Um, though I think that for some small corner cases, it makes sense. Well, thank you, everyone.